focus on the chemical hazards and of the organic cotton by Javier. And the last part will of course be the live Q&A session. So I'll be handing over to Francesco and be back for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, for attending uh, the meeting, the, the webinar today. In uh, my short presentation, I would like to give you a brief overview of the key aspects of uh, GMO testing in uh, cotton materials, um, in particular with uh, reference to the recently introduced uh, ISO uh, IVAR uh, 32 protocol for GMO testing in cotton. Next slide, please. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, our lab, Eurofins Genescan. Um, we are located in Freiburg in the southwest uh, of Germany. Eurofins Genescan is the competence center of the Eurofins group for uh, GMO testing. Um, our lab has uh, over 25 years of uh, experience in uh, molecular uh, um, biology testing and our uh, technical um, expertises are concentrated uh, into uh, main departments that we have here at the lab. One is the, uh, the testing service department um, where the, uh, the routine samples uh, are uh, analyzed. And the other department is the method development department in which um, uh, different uh, molecular biological methods uh, like for instance for uh, DNA extraction or for uh, PCR analysis can be uh, developed um, also for uh, external uh, um, customers that have uh, uh, a need for them. Next slide please. So when we talk about um, GM cotton and uh, we look at the global cultivation of uh, GM cotton, we have um, um, five main countries with over uh, one million hectares of uh, uh, GM cotton planting area. These are uh, um, India, uh, the US, China, Pakistan and uh, Brazil. So as you can see in this graph, the great majority of the planting area is cultivated with uh, uh, GM cotton, while the um, non-GM cotton um, represent only a small portion of the um, overall area. So uh, worldwide, the percentage of uh, um, GM cotton cultivation or GM cotton planting area in uh, comparison to the global planting area is around uh, 76%. Next slide, please. There is a long list of um, GM cotton varieties, uh, which are uh, called um, events. Um, And this, uh, these different uh, varieties um, carry uh, exogenous genes conferring uh, uh, different uh, uh, properties or different traits to the plants. So they can confer um, herbicide tolerance or uh, resistance to, to insects or uh, um, other traits, other peculiar traits. Next slide, please. Two of the main uh, standards for uh, organic cotton do not allow the use of uh, GM cotton. So these are the uh, Global organics, uh, Organic Textile Standard and the uh, Organic Content uh, Standard. According to these standards, um, cotton materials should be uh, tested for uh, GM cotton according to the um, ISO IVA 32 uh, protocol, which was uh, published in 2019. And the analysis should be carried out by um, ISO 17025 accredited labs 
that have successfully passed the, uh, the recent uh, um, proficiency test for this uh, uh, GMO testing protocol. Uh, the proficiency test was uh, uh, occurred uh, last year. So I'd like to mention that our lab, Eurofins Gene Scan, is of course um, accredited um, according to uh, ISO 17025 and was one of the labs that uh, successfully uh, passed uh, the proficiency test for the ISO IBA 32 protocol last year. Next slide, please. The ISO IBA 32 protocol describes um, three major uh, um, steps. So there are uh, three key points uh, of, uh, um, in this protocol. The first one is uh, um, the description of an effective way to isolate DNA from uh, different cotton materials. The DNA isolated, isolated from these materials is then used uh, for uh, a PCR analysis. So the second step is to um, is the description of the method um, for the confirmation uh, that the DNA extracted from the sample still contains um, amplifiable uh, cotton DNA, um, which is suitable for uh, uh, the PCR analysis. And finally, the third step is a screening method to detect all currently known uh, uh, GM cotton varieties. And the screening method is performed on the um, DNA isolated from the sample. Next slide, please. So our samples um, processed at our lab when uh, um, a GMO analysis is requested. So the material, the sample material, is first of all uh, normally homogenized to a fine powder. And a small portion of uh, this powder is used for uh, uh, the DNA extraction. The DNA extraction as well as the, the PCR analysis afterwards is carried out in a duplicate. And um, along the, um, the DNA extraction, uh, um, there are several, um, or there are uh, some controls monitoring the efficiency of the DNA extraction. At the end of the, uh, of the DNA extraction protocol, the quality and um, the quantity of the extracted DNA is, uh, is verified. Um, we verify if, uh, um, if they match, if the quality and the quantity match the expectations uh, uh, that we have for uh, uh, the provided sample. So if, they, um, if these parameters are, uh, um, match our expectations, we can use the DNA for the PCR uh, analysis. The PCR analysis is a, an enzymatic reaction that allows the detection of uh, specific DNA sequences. Next slide, please. So according to the ISO IVA32 protocol, um, there are seven targets uh, that will be um, tested in the uh, PCR analysis. So seven uh, DNA sequences that are targeted. One is, um, as I said before, um, a cotton reference gene that is used as positive control to verify that um, still enough cotton DNA uh, could be extracted uh, from the sample in order to perform the analysis. The other six targets are uh, um, GMO uh, sequences that are uh, um, engineered in, uh, um, in different cotton GMOs. So it's a GMO screening for uh, uh, six targets. We can then have different uh, results combinations. Um, first of all, 
if um, we can still detect the cotton reference gene, it means we could extract cotton DNA from the sample and we can uh, um, and, and we can reliably perform the uh, GMO screening. So if no GMO targets are detected, if they are all negative, then it can be concluded that uh, the sample does not contain GM cotton. If one or more GMO targets is positive, then it can be concluded that the sample contains GM cotton. If instead uh, the cotton reference gene uh, cannot be detected, in that case a conclusion is not possible because it means that uh, no uh, suitable cotton DNA could be extracted from the sample for the analysis. Next, please. So during the, uh, the validation of the iso iva 32 protocol, um, it was realized that um, the materials still containing, uh, or from which still um, uh, suitable cotton DNA could be extracted, are uh, um, the cotton materials of the production stages um, of cotton seed up to grage yarn, yarn and uh, grage uh, fabric. So the unprocessed um, cotton materials. While uh, um, processed yarn and processed fabric um, do not contain, or for, from, them, from them it could not be extracted uh, suitable uh, cotton DNA for the GMO analysis. So according to the iso iva protocol and also uh, according to the, um, uh, to the standards for organic cotton, the GM cotton testing should not be carried out in chemically processed cotton because this uh, that does not contain uh, sufficient cotton DNA for the uh, GMO analysis. Next, please. Yeah, I would like to mention that um, the identification and the quantification of the GM cotton varieties present in the sample is not part of the iso iva protocol. Um, this is an optional analysis that uh, we can offer uh, at our lab and uh, it might provide additional information uh, um, about the, um, the level of the GM cotton quant um, contamination and uh, um, about which GM cotton varieties are present in the sample. And this information might help to uh, investigate the, uh, the reasons uh, of the contamination. So my part is, uh, is over. And I would like to hand it now over to uh, Xavier. Thank you, Francesco. I hope everyone has learned as much as I'm learning with you today. So in my case, uh, related with the organic cotton, I think that it's important uh, that we discuss or we talk a bit about the chemical hazards, although this topic maybe is uh, more familiar to all the attendees today. and, and and the, the new one is the, talking about the organic cotton. But I think it's very interesting we, we have an overview about this. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I would like to start uh, by providing a, a, a brief introduction of the Eurofin soft lines and leather in this case, where we can provide services for the detection of uh, restricted substances uh, or restricted chemicals which are required, for example, by the GOTS certification. We have nowadays a global network of 10 laboratories uh, spread worldwide, which are specialized in, in textiles, garments, footwear, and, and leather testing. We have two competence centers uh, for this uh, international business line, which are located in Spain and UK. 
In case of United Kingdom, our technical competence center is specialized in, in leather and footwear. And the one uh, we have in Spain is expert, uh, is expert in textiles, footwear, and also notified body for PPEs. And uh, in the near future, also accredited for GOTS. Uh, of course, in all our laboratories, we have dedicated teams with uh, innovative mindset that will be serving you and helping you to understand the different requirements that are applicable to your product. And we are providing comprehensive solutions uh, that support not only the buyers, but also all the actors that can be found in the supply chain from the uh, conception or design of a product till it's placing in the market. Uh, so on the next slide, we are starting to discuss about the, the organic cotton and the chemical hazards. But before entering into more details, I would like that we review or that we learn everybody all together the definition of organic cotton. This, these definitions are official. And the, in this case, organic cotton can be understood as any of these two options. Uh, for today's topic would be the second one but also the first one could be applicable. So it would be cotton, which is produced without using any chemicals, man-made pesticides or artificial ingredients, or we have the second uh, definition, which is cotton, which is produced without proven toxic pesticides or synthetic uh, fertilizers using non-genetically modified seeds, as Francesco has been explaining. Uh, I want to mention that this step of, of showing the definition is necessary because not all the organic cotton that is in the market has been necessarily certified. Uh, I will enter later into details again about the two certifications that Francesco has introduced before. And uh, also, if we go to the next slide, I would like to mention or to explain here that in a similar way, we have to learn that consumers might understand that a product that is uh, being sold or, or that is being promoted as an organic can be uh, understood as a product uh, that is ecological or green or sustainable that has been maybe fairly produced, promoting diversity, safe, or, or that is health even for consumers. We know that the the growth of organic products in the market, not only talking about uh, textiles in this case, or cotton, uh, is, is there. There are more and more uh, shops that are offering organic products from coffee, seeds, for example, to textiles, as we show. But again, uh, all these claims together with the, with the organic uh, claim that we are talking today have to be demonstrated. So if we uh, go to the next slide and coming back again to the certification schemes that my colleague Fra Francesco uh, have introduced before, we can see that these certifications besides uh, the, the, the non-GM uh, presence of, of seeds, in this case of cotton, uh, have an ad additional requirements or additional assessment aspects uh, that covers many different aspects of, of the supply chain. Between them is the presence of hazardous chemicals. We are not entering into details in, uh, about the other assessment aspects like the water consumption, energy emissions, social consideration, chain of custody or traceability, and so on. Uh, also, besides these certification schemes, as uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you are aware, uh, besides these certifications, you know that uh, when one product is reaching the market, any market, there exist already uh, in most of the countries chemical regulations which are restricting or prohibiting the use of hazardous chemicals. Uh, we can have the example in Europe of the REACH regulation, or the POPs regulation as well, could be an example applicable. But in here, uh, where we wanted to, 
to, to arrive is where can these chemicals be found? Uh, or how can I make sure that, that, the, that the product is not containing hazardous chemicals in this case? So if we go to the next slide, in this case, we can see an example of a textile value chain uh, for cotton production. It's just an example that is, uh, as we are showing, goes from the growing of the cotton to the production of a garment. Of course, we are not introducing additional steps that can be found in a textile value chain. Um, but in here, we wanted to show these steps where the, the addition of chemicals and, in consequence, possible hazardous chemicals uh, can, be, can occur in this case. Uh, I have to mention in this case that the processing we have placed in this example, the processing, as you see in the in the fourth step, but could be uh, before spinning or after spinning or in, in, in that way. Okay, it depends on where the dyeing or printing or finishing is happening, uh, but this can be moved. The important thing is to mention here that we can have different chemicals that can be used at different steps. And it's mm, very important in this case to understand uh, what or where we are in the supply chain uh, in order to do a, re a proper risk assessment of one product and test and assess uh, the, the chemical hazards in front of that. So uh, in this case, it's important to know about the process uh, because as mentioned, uh, on the step where we are, uh, the targeted chemicals can be different. So it is not the same that I target chemicals in the, in the early stage, for example, during growing or after, after harvesting the, the, the cotton, than if we are uh, with a product that has been already processed and has been already dyed or printed or finished. Of course, during this process, this processing step, is uh, the, the step where more chemicals are being used. And the solutions here, of course, uh, are very different. In our case, we offer not only testing, uh, we offer also uh, chemical audits and, and, and chemical management audits in, in the whole supply chain. And for this important, something uh, very interesting that the two certifications that we were explaining our covering is the, the, the chain of custody and the, the traceability of a product. So it's very important that even if a product that you, in this case, know that it's organic or you it's, it's arriving to you as organic, that you understand as well, very well, the, the, the whole textile value chain and understand the traceability of one product because as I'm pretty sure that you better know, know better than me, uh, a textile supply chain could be very complex uh, because if you are the, the garment distributor, for example, or the garment manufacturer, uh, for instance, you should know that before you there is a, a, someone that is weaving or knitting uh, the, the, the fabric. Also, there should be someone that is processing the fabric before this step, someone is spinning. And then before this step, of course, we saw that we have the gro cotton growing and lean. And we have to add here that we have different suppliers of chemicals, different suppliers of components that can be found as well in, in, a, in a textile and apparel, for example. So for this reason, and I want to insist here that it's very important to understand and to learn about the, the the value chain and the traceability of one product. So uh, in the next slide, I want to provide just some examples of chemicals that can be found uh, in the different steps of the, of the value chain. We are not entering into details of all the possible chemicals that, that are restricted with the certifications or legally restricted in different countries because we could be here until tomorrow. Uh, but basically, just five or six chemicals which are could be interesting. So one of them that is being monitored uh, 
on, on legal basis and also in the two certifications that we have mentioned before are the pesticides. Pesticides can be tested uh, along, I mean, in a finished product, but ideally, uh, if we go up waters, would be easier to, to implement any solution or any corrective action if the testing of any pe presence of pesticide is done after the, the harvesting of the cotton, of course. So basically, and uh, here we are not discovering you the, the, the wheel, uh, the, the pesticides are being used to manage pests or vegetation, but also can be added to animal skins or animal fibers in order to avoid any any pest growing. Okay. In the next slide, we are talking about uh, intermediate uh, steps that, that could be, for example, spinning, uh, weaving and knitting. Normally, these are mechanical processes, and most of you might think in here very few chemicals can be used. I'm adding here the example of the PAHs because in this case, this, this substance can be found, as you see, in, in, in different uses like uh, pigments and dyes, printing pasties, dispersing agents, plastics, and, and, and finishing uh, and finishes like lacquers and coatings. But also, the PAHs are quite common in, in lubricants. Uh, we have found through testing in this case that sometimes the PIHs are non-intentionally added substances and in this case are contaminants that might be coming for example from the from the machinery that is being used to process the textiles so for example of course the, the spinning mills in this case and the spinning uh, machines need to be very well lubricated in order to work properly so this in this case we can have traces uh, or presence of PAHs as a resulting uh, contamination from the from the machinery. So it's very important that we assess and consider the, the process. And in here, as I mentioned, uh, in the chemical management audits, uh, this could be something that can be assessed as well during the production of a, a, a yarn, for example. It can be assessed which chemicals also are being used uh, during the production and not directly added to the to the product okay uh, going to the next slide we are showing here three or four examples of products or of substances sorry uh, that of course can be used during uh, processing uh, textile in any of their forms in fiber in fabric uh, or in finished uh, ready-made garment, for example. And we have the bespoken formaldehyde. Everyone knows uh, about the formaldehyde. It's a res legally restricted substance in, in many places. Uh, basically, it can be used in resins and can be used also as a finishing agent, for example, to provide to fabrics or garments the, the finishing of ring free or easy iron also can be used as a, as a fixing agent for prints or can be found as well as part of the of the formula of adhesives and and and, and glues as well as i mentioned or as, uh, also maybe as you know formaldehyde is a carcinogenic in europe has been recently restricted uh, in the entry 72 of the Annex 17 of REITs, uh, in, in use of, of in, in textiles, basically. And there are other countries as well, or other regions worldwide, as you may be aware, that also are restricting the use of this substance due to, to its uh, carcinogenic properties. In the next slide, uh, we are just showing the example of the azodyes also are very well known. Uh, these azodyes, of course, uh, as the own name are indicated, can be found mainly in textiles, leather, and synthetic leather, which has been dyed or printed, because uh, 
obviously they are present there. These substances are as well uh, classified as CMR, carcinogenic, mutagenic, or toxic for reproduction. In Europe, also, they are restricted. Uh, in, in many other countries, like, for example, uh, or regions also are restricted, like, for example, in Saudi Arabia, in China, in Russia, uh, Australia, and, and many other countries are restricting the use of uh, ASODIs in this case. And, of course, in the two certifications that we presented before, uh, these, these substances are also restricted. And uh, I think that we have the next slide is the last example, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it would be the carcinogenic or allergenic dyes. Uh, uh, also the same as, as, as we saw before. Uh, these substances can be present in textiles due to the use of different dyes and prints. Besides these, these chemicals that I just presented to you, uh, there exists also a, a long list that I'm pretty sure that you know, but we can have also flame retardants, which are uh, can be added uh, during the finishing processes, or uh, the heavy metals that can be present due to contamination, uh, but also due to the use of the different uh, metals or metallic elements in, in dyes and, and prints, for example. We can have the present, for example, of uh, hexavalent chromium, which is being used in this case in, in leather, not in, in cotton, uh, and, and many other substances that can be used, for example, for finishing, like the PFC, PFC substances to provide this finishing for to repeal uh, water uh, or oil, phthalates, and, and many others. And uh, in the next slide, to conclude here, uh, just to provide this, this thought, so is all the claim cotton real organic? So this is something that I that 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 I want that I ask to myself, for example, if when I see something that is there. So how to make sure that something that is claimed as organic, of course, uh, is really organic. So it is necessary that we ensure that the cotton production and the value chain does not include the use of any restricted or prohibited chemicals, besides the other aspects that, that we have mentioned. So how can we do so? Uh, in this case, uh, there are many different options. We have, of course, the ultimate option is always the lab testing, where we can uh, assess a product, uh, a textile, in this case, a cotton fabric or a cotton garment for the presence of any of the restricted uh, substances, for example, legally restricted, or if we are talking about any certification scheme. But also there are options uh, that can be made alone or in combination with the testing that uh, implies to, to be working, let's say, upwaters. And is to assess uh, again uh, uh, as well the the supply chain, understand again the 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 traceability of one product, and and conduct different chemical uh, assessments on the on the different uh, actors which are present in the supply chain in order to assess the possible presence or absence of uh, hazardous chemicals in in a finished product. With this. Uh, let's say, a traceability assessment, what we get is to reduce the risk uh, when we have a ready-made garment. Of course, if we find a, a chemical, there are very few uh, possibilities to, let's say, to amend the problem. But if we work up, up waters, in this case, uh, the possibilities to avoid problems in the finished product uh, are increased. And... Uh, just to finalize and before the questions in this last slide, uh, and here we just want to provide you some reasons to, to choose uh, our labs in this case for, for GMO testing. As Francesco has been explained, uh, they have very well-renowned 
expertise in, in the GMO field with many years of uh, experience. We also have um, expertise in textiles and garment industry, and we have presence also globally, uh, which which also can provide also an, an asset in, in that sense. Uh, we can develop as well comprehensive solutions from the organic cotton's market inception. So from the very beginning until the product is uh, already in the shops, we can provide uh, different solutions. And also very important, on all, all the services that we are explaining today here or that we are providing are conducted by Eurofins Labs uh, in Europe in case of GMO but for any uh, chemicals can be tested as well in our different labs uh, which are located worldwide. Uh, as Francesco has explained to you, uh, their lab in, in, in Germany is one of the few that passed the, which is accredited under the ISO IC uh, 17025 for the ISO uh, IWA 32 okay for the screening of genetically modified uh, organisms and regarding testing just to mention that we our labs are able to provide the analysis of more than 200 different pesticides and of course confirming the presence or absence of more than 250 toxic substances according to the legal requirements or the different certification schemes so fiona uh, i pass to you i don't know if we have some questions. Yes, thank you, Javier, and thank you, Francesco. So yes, we do get like ten or fifteen questions on hand already, and I'll just let Javier and Francesco to take a little short break and do a little promotion. So Javier and has introduced our organic cotton testing packages, and I have also shared the flyers over this handouts function. So feel free to take a look, and actually, I have got a few requests or interest in understanding more about the detail, the cost of the services. So if you also want to get a code from us, you can drop us a message in the chat box. So let's begin with the Q&A. First one, uh, quite a technical question for Francesco. Um, if 99% of the lawn GM cotton is accidentally blend with 1% GM cotton. Will your test say GM cotton detect without being able to define the percentage? Well, it, uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I, I cannot uh, answer it uh, uh, in advance. Um, the the limit of detection of the PCR analysis is uh, is very low, is uh, um, is set at 0.01 um, percent uh, weight weight DNA. Um, so it it depends on how much cotton the cotton DNA the sample contains. Uh, if it is a, a raw material, there is a, an higher chance to to detect small contaminations. If it is a processed uh, material uh, with uh, low, D low cotton DNA levels, then uh, the chance to, uh, to detect a small contamination in the original material is, uh, uh, is less. Hmm. Okay, so I hope this has answered the participant questions. If you do have more questions, don't feel, f uh, feel free to ping us anytime. The next question, is more about oh, so it is also another technical question for Francesco. Uh, oh, sorry, because there are quite a lot of questions. Ah, so another question is there a threshold under the ISO IWA32 protocol as far as limits are concerned? Okay. Can you please repeat it? Uh, is there a threshold under the ISO protocol as far as the limit are concerned? Sorry, I still didn't, didn't get it. Uh, didn't get uh, what maybe we can follow up the questions through email after the webinar. 
So we can address another questions now. Okay, so the next question is for Javier. Is it possible to make sure that a product is made from organic cotton without doing a test? Through the textile exchange certification, for example, Javier? Sorry, I was on mute and talking to myself. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> but yeah, uh, in this case, I think the question is for both, for Francesco and me, but I think that the initially the only way to assess if a product is made uh, from GM or non-GM uh, cotton uh, is through uh, is through the testing and detection and, and, and see if any genetically modified uh, seeds have been used. Uh, am I right in this case, Francesco? Yes, yes, you're, you're right. Um, mm. Okay, another question, I guess, is also for both of the guests. Uh, uh, pardon, Fiona. If I can, now I got uh, the, the question before or so in, in the chat. Um, so if, if it, there is a threshold under the ISO IVA 32 protocol as far as limits are concerned. So I, 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 I didn't uh, get acoustic. Okay, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so no, there is no threshold. Uh, the ISO IVA 32 uh, just defines, it's just a qualitative uh, screening and it uh, states that uh, if uh, GMO sequences are detected, then um, the sample should be considered as uh, containing GM cotton. Um, I think I, I read in the um, in the OCS standard that um, there is a, um, or there are some plans to perhaps introduce a threshold in the uh, in the future. Uh, Based on the, on the current uh, uh, on the current experience, on the current uh, values, uh, so that, that might um, it, it's something that might uh, uh, happen in the future. Mm. Okay, and yes, the next. Oh, thank you, Francesco. The next question, I think, it is also the query of many of the participants here. So. There are two international standards that do not allow the GM cotton, but as shown in the slide, GM cotton is the majority supply in the global supply chain. So how is it possible for the suppliers to get or to provide regulated materials? Any views on this, Francesco or Javier? Uh, yes, I think that the answer or the question in this case is similar to the one that I answered before and, and mm -hmm. would be the same. I think that in this case, in order to verify uh, as part of the process and uh, to verify that one product is organic would be first the verification of uh, the presence of non-genetically modified cotton. Then, of course, if we undergo under a specific certification scheme, we would need to comply with the additional requirements. For example, the GOTS has uh, additional requirements that have to be complied as well, the, the OCS certification, or if there is a, let's say, a brand uh, internal requirement regarding organic cotton, uh, these also have to be complied. Mm. Okay, thank you. So next question, Again, for Javier, can pesticide be detected on grape yarn, or is it only possible to be detected on brewing cotton? No, also in grape yarn, it's possible to detect the uh, pesticides as well. Mm. And what okay. I wanted to, to mention here is that uh, as much as we approach to the to the earliest stage of the of the value chain, it's easier. Uh, to detect them and also easier to implement any any corrective or preventive action in this case. Mm, okay, 
So another question. So although it is not the key scope of this webinar today, so one of the participants is asking in the asking about the certification process of organic cotton. So Harvey, do you want to answer this briefly? Uh, I'm using organic, okay. So in this case, uh, the certification process for organic cotton, first you need to choose the, which of the certifications you would like, because depending on, on them, the, the scheme is different. In our case, what we offer is the, the, the GOTS, and also depending on, on which stage or, or which actor is your company, in this case, the certification process could be different. Uh, it is not the same. The requirements that might be applicable to the cotton producer, that the requirements that are uh, applicable in this case to a garment manufacturer. Okay, because uh, as I mentioned, there are many different uh, topics which are assessed uh, during the certification, and one of them that I was explaining before were the, the water consumption or the water pollution, not only during the production of the garment, but also in the, uh, in the other steps. Also, the energy demand uh, for the production of, of, of the garment or, and the different steps uh, within the supply chain. Also, the assessment and calculation of the different emissions uh, are assessed as well, social consideration and so on. So basically, the, the assessment of one process or product evaluates uh, these different aspects, okay? And also additionally, uh, it is con there are some audits which are conducted in place in the, in, that can take place in the site where the product is being, it's being uh, produced, but also can be extended to, to the different actors which are present in the supply chain. Additionally, in, for example, these two certifications that we have been discussing, and very briefly, um, uh, it is necessary to conduct uh, or to assess the, the product, in this case, the cotton, uh, at any of their manufacturing stages, uh, to assess the product for the presence of any hazardous chemicals. Okay, so these are basically the main requirements. If all of them are fitting with the, with the in this case, the OTS or OCS uh, requirement, then a certification is granted to the, to the company. Mm, okay, thank you. Ah, the next question is for Francesco. So can you explain how to interpret the GMO testing results as per GMO gen patrons shown on the first slide? Well, the, the GMO analysis that uh, um, is applied according to the iso iba uh, protocol is a GMO screening. So we use a reduced set of uh, GMO targets uh, to detect all uh, um, known GMO varieties. Uh, that, that was the, the list I showed in my first or second slide. Is it this one? Yes, yes exactly. So <laughs> all these uh, varieties are uh, detected uh, um, or, or contain this, uh, uh, at least one of these uh, G six GMO targets. So um, if uh, one of the GMO targets, of the screening GMO targets is detected, uh, um, we still don't know which variety is present. Um, in order to identify the GMO variety present in the sample, we need to add additional tests. But as I um, explained in one slide, this additional test, this uh, identification tests are not part of the um, ISO-IVA uh, protocol. But it's, uh, it's something that we can, uh, we can offer, if, uh, if it helps. Mm, okay, thank you. This question is also for you. What is the level of accuracy for measuring GMO cotton in your test? Is there an acceptable level of GM contamination? Well, um, it, it is not um, not up to uh, 
to the lab to, to define what an acceptable level is. So um, we have to refer to the standards for organic cotton. And um, currently there is no, uh, no threshold, as I said before, for, uh, um, for an acceptable contamination. Um, it, the, the evaluation is really based only on the qualitative results. So is GM cotton present or not? Um, oh. Without considering uh, uh, the, the level of the contamination, as I said before, um, I think a, a threshold or, a, or a, an acceptable level might be introduced in the future uh, in, uh, in these standards. But um, right now, in the current version of these standards, and according to the ISO IBAP uh, protocol. Um, the evaluation is done on, only on the qualitative results, so uh, positive, negative. Mm. Thank you. Another question is also for Francesco. So I think I think people are quite interested in understanding more about how the DNA testing is done. So the question is, what would be the main reason for not being able to extract DNA as per the required criteria? Yes. Um, so basically, uh, the DNA is uh, uh, degraded by uh, by mechanical processes, by chemical processes, so by uh, by heat, by uh, uh, pressure, by um, yeah chemical treatment, um, unprocessed raw materials. Uh, like uh, cotton seeds or uh, or lint contain still uh, plenty of uh, DNA, um, but if these materials are then uh, processed um, through uh, processes like the ones I, I mentioned, then the DNA is destroyed. So after the processing, there is no DNA left or very few DNA left that can be extracted uh, from the sample for the analysis. Mm, okay, so the next question uh, is for Harvey, I think. So, what about the traceability that you have mentioned? How do you trace the supply chain? Like, how do you know who is the spinning mill for a weaving factory before you conduct a chemical test on the product? Or do you rely on your client to provide you the contact of spinning mill and farms before you conduct a chemical test? Well, uh, these two options can be applicable, but we can go further and, and, and beyond that. And basically, this is, can be done by auditing directly in place the, the company, which is the producer, and check different documentation, check the, the raw materials that this company is receiving and from who uh, they are receiving, because they may have one or several suppliers. So. This is the way that, that we can do. Ideally, uh, the supplier should be the one providing the information. And then once doing the, the assessment of the company, we can double check that the information provided by the supplier in this case is, is uh, it's appropriate and, and correct. And uh, additionally, what we check is that there is no any missing or any I don't want to mention in that way any hidden information in here that could make a product not qualifiable uh, as organic or as uh, in this case organic that we are talking today, but that could be not qualified for other certification as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question. So I think so. Although we are. Uh, close to the webinar end time, so I think we will stay a little bit longer to take up a few more questions. But for questions that we are unable to address within this webinar, we will follow up through email. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. And of course, this webinar will be, the recording will be shared together with the presentation file in a day or two after the webinar over our email. So another question for Javier, if you have got the GOTS certification from the supplier, would it be enough to ensure that the material is real organic cotton? Yeah, theoretically, it uh, should be in that way. Uh, if you 
have one product that is uh, describing the certification, of course, should be fine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, another question for Francesco. So if the GM cotton testing should not be performed on processed material, then how do we detect GM cotton on a final garment? Well, basically, if uh, if you are uh, at the end of the production chain, um, then of course you have less chances to uh, to verify that uh, the cotton uh, is non-GM. Um, if you um, do not if you do not have access to the um, underlying raw materials or to previous uh, um, production stages. Um, then um, I think you have to rely on the uh, yeah on the documentation provided by by your suppliers. But maybe uh, Javier can can comment more on that. Yeah, that's it. In, in would be in that way. In in the case that you are the last step the distributor or retailer in this case, uh, and you have no access to the initial stages uh, of the supply chain. Uh, one of the options, just uh, referring to the previous question, is to rely on, on certificates of compliance, in this case, uh, regarding, uh, for example, GOTS or OCS should be a proof of compliance that the product is, is uh, organic. Uh, and in case this is not possible or certificates are not uh, in place, the second option could be this assessment or auditing in the supply chain in order to arrive as uh, much as possible to the early stages. But in any case, uh, it is necessary also to ensure that the traceability from, let's say, from raw materials to the garment is very clear. Okay, and sometimes this is quite complex to, to assess as well. Okay, so a follow-up question for Francesco. So what is the detection rate for the ISO test? How how tiny the quantity of GM cotton can be detected through the test? So, um, uh, as I said before, um, it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, to provide an answer uh, in advance, so because it really it depends on the um, on the stage of uh, um, of production um, of the of the materials of material we, we test. Mm. Um, as I said, if if we test the raw material, uh, we have uh, lots of uh, cotton DNA, and it's uh, easier uh, to detect also a small contamination. Uh, but if we are uh, analyzing a, a material at the end of the production um, stage, so a process material, then we might have very little cotton DNA and uh, a contamination uh, in the original raw material um, might be not any more uh, detectable in this case. Mm. Thank you. And also another question for you, Francesco. Is there any limitation of the fiber mixture to detect GM cotton traces, like other cell fibers or synthetic fibers mixing with the cotton? Um, well, the, the presence of uh, syn synthetic fibers might have um, some impact on the analysis. Hmm. Um, they might uh, interfere uh, interfere in the analysis, um, in the PCR analysis, for instance, or in the enzymatic reaction. Hmm. Uh, it is something that, um, yeah. Also, in this case, it's not really possible to to provide an answer uh, in in advance. So we really have to. Uh, to verify this for the specific sample that uh, uh, that we have in our hands, 
um, but of course the 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 higher uh, the amount of or the proportion of uh, uh, non cotton fibers or synthetic synthetic fibers um, the less is the the chance to uh, yeah to detect the contamination with gm cotton in the uh, in the cotton fibers mm. So another question from you, Francesco. So apart from the PCR test, which will probably worry if the cost, if the cotton is GMO or not, are there other proof tests that can be proof tests that can be done in order to detect the validity of the organic cotton? So I believe there are, she is asking about if there are other tests available apart from the. PCR test. Well, no, the, the PCR test is the only uh, the only method to uh, to detect GM cotton, and this is also a requirement uh, um, of, of the of the organic cotton standards. So the, the testing should be performed uh, according to the ISO IBAR protocol, and uh, the ISO IBAR uh, thirty two protocol defines the PCR as the method of choice. Um, mm. Of course, um, as uh, I've here explained, um, the, the presence of uh, uh, GMOs is not on, not the only criteria uh, that uh, defines organic cotton. So there are also uh, lots of other uh, substances that should be uh, tested for uh, in order to uh, to verify that the cotton is organic. Mm. Okay. Next question is for Javier. So Javier, you have introduced the process chemical testing. So the question is, does it make does it make sense to test the presence of chemical hazard for GOTS certified products? Uh, well, if one product is uh, certified and, 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 and the certification is, is can be checked that of course is real. Uh, it will not be necessary because uh, the GOTS, the GOT certification, also implies the testing of, of hazardous substances, so will not be necessary in the in this case. Mm, okay, so I guess we will take our last questions, which is also about the GOTS. So in the case if his supply, my suppliers, he can provide the GOTS certificate of the product. So would it be enough to make sure that? The product is real organic cotton. Uh, I'm not sure if I got well. The question is: a supplier is providing the scope certificate. That's the scope, mm -hmm. and the product they buy uh, is within that the scope. Well, in this case, uh, the best is not only the mention that the the scope of the certificate, they have to provide the certification itself because all certifications have a, a number, a, a unique number that also can be <coughs> checked in the official sources of the issuer of the certification. And uh, so you can check as well that the validity of that certificate and that the content of the scope that the supplier is declaring to you is really is really there. Okay, but okay, also, I, I would like to mention also that it will depend on the relationship you have and the confidence you have also with your supplier. <laughs> okay, thank you, Javier. So, a very interesting answer. Uh, so, we have finished most of the questions. So, we have a few quite a long, some a few long questions that we are unable to address. And it is difficult for us to address the long questions in a webinar as well. So, we will follow up through emails. And thank you very much for joining this webinar. And thank you very much also for the time of our two speakers. They have also spent a lot of time in preparing the materials. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime. Here is here is their contact information. And also make sure you can check out our website and follow us in LinkedIn so you can get all the news from us easily. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope to see you again in our upcoming webinars. Until we meet again, take care and goodbye.